Okay. There we go. We are live with the great, powerful, amazing Dr. Mike T. Nelson. Thank you so much for coming on board. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. really appreciate me being back on the show. Always fun to chat. Absolutely. It is always fun getting to connect. And so you've been on before, but if somebody's tuning in, they don't know who you are, how about we give them the quick elevator pitch, who, who you are, what you do, all that fun jazz. Yeah, so I have a PhD in exercise physiology, looking more on the metabolism side. Uh, my PhD thesis was on heart rate variability and metabolic flexibility. I own uh, Extreme Human Performance. Uh, through that, I do the Flex Diet Certification and the Physiologic Flexibility Certification. Do some online training for one-on-one -on -one clients. And then I'm an Associate Professor at the Kerrig Institute and Adjunct Professor at Rocky Mountain University. Beautiful. Yeah. That's good. You've practiced that. I have. And, <laughs> you know, you can throw the random stuff in there, teach for RPR once in a while. And uh, I would say present at other conferences and stuff, but haven't done too much of that the past two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like you're, you're the fitness, the fitness world version of the most interesting man in the world. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, uh, so you got your hands in so many different places. You're involved and just like intertwined everywhere. But uh, I just want to jump right in today. Yeah. So the topic today, we're going to be talking salt and we're going to be talking electrolytes. This is something that I'm seeing become more and more popular, more and more mainstream, more and more people are having conversations on this topic. Should I be putting a lot of salt in my food? Should I be putting these electrolytes in my water once or twice a day, right? Rob Wolf started his new, I think it's LMNT. Yep. Right? Yep, LMNT. His um, element, his, that's good. I like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, his electrolyte company. But I just don't think many people actually understand, like, what is this? What's it doing? Is there an advantage? Should I be doing this? What's going on, like, underneath the hood? And so I'll just give a quick kind of background, mm -hmm. basic Gen Chem 101 stuff here, right? So for people that don't have that background, what we're really talking about here is you have a solvent and then you have a solute. And so water is the universal solvent. Water is a polar molecule. So oxygen is more electronegative. It pulls more electrons to it. So it holds this a, like negative bias of a charge. And then hydrogen is opposite. The electrons get pulled away from it. So it's more positive. And so what that means, if I put anything into water that then has a charge, it will be pulled apart. So salt, as an example, sodium chloride. Sodium is positively charged. Chloride is negatively charged. So the chloride is going to be attracted to the hydrogen and the sodium is going to be attracted to the oxygen on water. So water is the solvent and then salt would be the solute. And one of the things that's really important that I'm sure is going to come up in this conversation is that solvent follows solute. If we think about a direction of flow, solvent will follow solute. So if I have water, and then I have like this mesh screen that things can pass through and I have a ton of salt on the other side. The salt's not what's going to move. The water is going to actually move towards the salt. Solvent will follow solute. Just a quick Gen Chem background for people because that's going to be really pertinent for this conversation. Dr. Mike, did I... I like it. I that's good. Perfect background. Anything there. Is that a good background? Yeah. No, that's perfect. Okay. Beautiful. So when we think about... Let's just start salt. We'll just go salt first, and then we can kind of transition to electrolytes because electrolytes is a larger category. But you have gentlemen like Stan Efferding for a very long time who have been kind of preaching this salt, salt, salt. Like put a ton of, ton of salt on your food, this high salt approach for people that really train and push it and get after it. And so I would love to unpack some of the, some of the why behind that. What are some of the potential advantages why would somebody who's training three, four, five, six times a week want to potentially do that? What is the salt doing? Um, and in particular, right, because I think sometimes people still hear this whole salt gambit. And they're like, well, what about my blood pressure? Yeah. Like uh, everyone's told me if I have a lot of salt, my blood, I'm just going to, my, my arteries and heart are just going to explode gonna from burst. pressure. Um, they're just going to burst immediately. So kind of a, a broad intro there, but I'll let you take it where you want. Because I just would love to unpack a little bit of the what's going on. And why is this potentially a, a thing that people listening may want to consider doing? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest 
sort of on ramp is hydration related to heat and more extreme climates. Um, cause that's how I kind of, I guess, started it. Like we've been down in Costa Rica at our buddy, Dr. Ben house's place. And I remember the first time I went down there, that was before they had his place. And I don't remember the last time I sweat that much in two weeks, <laughs> it was <laughs> crazy hot. And, you know, I had, you know, worked with athletes who would exercise in the heat and all that kind of stuff, but it's, it's different when it's yourself because it's easy, I think, to miss the ball. And I remember about like day four down there the first day and I'm going, man, why do I just feel like just complete ass? I don't feel good at all. And I'm like, I should be recovered by now. I haven't even really trained that hard. And then I realized I'm like, oh, cause I'm down here sweating my nutsack off all the time that <laughs> I probably need more salt in addition to the water I was drinking. Right, because I realized I was drinking a ton of water and I was just like whizzing all the time. I'm like, oh, I'm probably not retaining any of the water, right? So exactly to your your conversation there, oh, I should probably add more salt. So I started, you know, just salting the piss out of all my my food. I'm like, wow, I I feel better. So then fast forward to you know the next couple of times we were down there, it'd be interesting to see new people who had never been there before. You'd be like, hey, you should have more salt. They're like, ah, I'm fine, whatever. You know, like day two or three, they're like, why do I feel so bad? My ankles are all swollen. They never swell, you know? And so I was mm -hmm. kind of like the salt pusher guy. I'm like, here, just have more salt. They're like, what? That, but salt, that's <laughs> bad. What are you doing? You know, and, and sure enough, they would. And they're like, oh, I feel so much better now. Um, so I think especially in an extreme environment where you're sweating a lot, right? Because now you've got a loss of sodium. You've got a loss of... Um, fluid that's more profound, you can kind of see bigger differences. Unfortunately, it wasn't until probably like around three years ago, I kind of made the connection to, oh, maybe I need more sodium during other times. Um, and that was around that time I talked to uh, Rob and uh, Luis and uh, Tyler, the Element guys, and I actually saw some of uh, Stan Everding stuff at the same time too. Like everyone's talking about more and more salt and I'm like, oh, weird. So I looked at a quote, clean eating of a, a client and just did a chronometer thing and did a rough back of the envelope, like how much sodium do they get? Assuming they weren't salting their food or anything else. Because in my brain, I thought, why would you not salt your food, right? So my assumption with most of the people I was working with was <laughs> that they were all salting their food and that it's probably not a big deal. So I do the back of the envelope calculation. I look and I'm like, wow, if you're eating mostly like real food, whole foods, not stuff out of a a can or a bag, like you don't really get that much sodium. And if you're not adding external salt to your food, you could actually have very low levels of sodium. So I started asking my clients, I'm like, I know it's like a stupid question, but like you salt your food, right? And like half of them are like, no, that's bad. I'm like, what? Oh shit. <laughs> And so then I started having them <laughs> just add sea salt to their food. And they're like, wow, I feel better. And their performance would, you know, go up. And even recently, like this happened again, I, a client in, uh, I won't say where, um, she's training for a boxing match and I'm asking her, I said, Hey, I, you're, you salt your food, right? Because she, her training volume was pretty high. She's like, no, I'm like, no, I'm like, just, you know, add more salt to your food. Um, and then I realized everyone started getting better and then I'm like, okay, so hmm, if that works, like, I wonder how much higher can I go? Like, so this past year, like little element packets have like a thousand milligrams of sodium in them. So I said, okay, before I go to the gym, even in a normal environment where I'm not sweating a lot, I'm going to add one packet to a liter of water. Oh, huh. gym performance, like was consistently better. It wasn't like. Um, sometimes you have really good days and you have bad days, but there's that variability between your good days and your bad days, and especially this past year of not mm -hmm. traveling, being at home, you can control a lot more variables. I realized that the more fluid and sodium I had, like the days were just much, much more consistent. I wouldn't have like one out of every sessions was just complete other dog shit for like no reason I could figure out. I was like, Oh, interesting. Um, so I think it's one of the, it's almost like so simple. I think like I come guilty of completely missing it and it does help i've had people measure their blood pressure you know no one's you know 
had high blood pressure from it. Uh, most of that, like, as you know, if you look at the research is people who are sensitive to sodium. So yes, if you've got, you know, stage three, you know, heart failure, a bag of chips is probably not going to be very good because of the sodium and you just have a really hard time. All your systems to keep that in balance are just whacked and you have a pathology. Yes, you can, you can see massive changes in sodium and water weight because of that in those people. But in a healthy person, if you're the small minority who are sensitive to uh, salt, which again, you can measure by just doing your at-home blood pressure to make sure you're okay, then most people are gonna be you know, just fine. Because what we find is homeostasis wins again, right? At some point, your body is gonna try to equalize those. And on the survival end of the spectrum, we know that if you go super low on uh, sodium, or you increase fluid levels so high in a short period of time that you can actually die uh, from that, right? You can have uh, hyponatremia, which just means that you've pissed out all of your sodium so far by drinking too much fluid. Um, so mm -hmm. paradoxically, maybe in theory, you could take too much sodium and have an issue, but most of the time your issue is gonna be you're on the toilet trying to get rid of it. <laughs> what we have, I think established here from a bird's eye view standpoint is that the primary benefit coming from the utilization of salt electrolytes etc is that it's going to allow us to hold on to more fluid volume mm -hmm. obviously hugely beneficial in high temperatures but it also sounds like from just back of the back of the napkin experiments that what's going to end up happening is that you're also potentially going to see improvements in more thermoneutral environments as well yeah that's what i've seen also and if we look at what might be going on we know with aerobic training one of the things that happens relatively fast is you get an expansion in plasma volume right so just the amount of sort of fluid your body is pushing around right so if you go to the other end of the spectrum everybody knows that dehydration depending on what percentage you look at, uh, in general is not so good for performance, right? If, you, if you're running, you could argue, you could be maybe on the hairy edge where you're a little bit dehydrated, you pick up a little bit of efficiency, but you're kind of you know running with scissors at that point. Um, so in general, dehydration can be bad for performance. On the other side, if you could take in more volume and expand your plasma volume within reason, uh, you're actually going to be able better able to deliver oxygen to tissue, better blood flow, um, and that's actually going to help uh, performance. So that's one of the changes with big aerobic difference. Uh, plasma volume actually goes up a little bit when you first start doing it. Yeah, I was going to say, if we were going to unpack why the increased volume matters, we don't have to go super into the weeds here, right? But sweating and, and heat, if we want to use that as the example, because I think sometimes the extremes are a great place mm -hmm. to, to have an example. So fluid loss and temperature is a major problem because like if I start sweating out and start dropping my fluid volume, then you're basically going to be decreasing preload. Yep. So I'm going to be decreasing the amount of blood that I can get back to the heart, which is then going to drop cardiac output, which means I'm not getting as much supply and in whole body exercise, we can very confidently say that you're going to be supply limited. So it's like, you're just taking something that's already going to be a limiter and you're making it more of a limiter because cardiac output has to fall if I drop fluid volume. So if I can maintain fluid volume or bump it higher, now I can increase cardiac output. I can increase supply. And as you mentioned, by right, maybe the thing we're going to get from that is I can increase this MVO2 component which is gonna be enormously helpful for us from a performance standpoint. Yep, and how this is related, if someone's ever done exercise, especially cardiovascular exercise, where you kind of know what your normal heart rate is and you're a little bit dehydrated, you'll notice that your heart rate tends to spike up higher, right? Because cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. If I'm trying to hold that cardiac output, I'm trying to hold that level of performance, which has a bunch of different things, and my stroke volume is going down, my heart rate has to go up to try to make up for that difference. Yeah, that's just the cardiac drift. Similar yes. thing that you'll see in long-term aerobic exercise, because as you mentioned, right, like as you start losing fluid volume, stroke volume has to decrease. 
And so your only option to try to maintain cardiac output is to start jacking up my heart rate. But I can only take I can only take a heart rate so high. Right. right? It's like, going to hit a, be a max. Very, it's, a, it's a poor strategy. <laughs> um, and so I think that's kind of a good a good background here in terms of the salt, the electrolytes. What are they doing? Why do they matter? Why are they potentially advantageous to you and your performance? One of the things I've thought about, I'd be curious to get your input on this. If we want to think about what's going on at the cellular level. So we talked about how this fluid volume can potentially help us with supply, get more oxygen to tissues, et cetera. Do you think you will potentially see changes at the cellular level in terms of the amount of fluid and or nutrients that are going to be brought into the cell by having higher salt, more electrolytes, higher fluid volume? I'd be interested in your opinion on this, but I think you could make an argument that probably right now, whether that would stay long term because of the other adaptations you would have to that, I'm not sure. Um, but by changing some of the local pressure gradients, uh, if they stay changed, which I think that part might be debatable, um, I would say that you would expect an increase in performance. What would your thoughts be on that? Yeah, I think acutely. Right. It would make sense to see these changes in terms of like maybe increase cell volume. Like you're getting more into the cell acutely. Chronically, like you said, homeostasis always wins. So there'll be some type of long-term adjustment, but acutely around the training window, maybe like large exposure to acute differences can give us a significant improvement over time. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's the way I think about it. I mean, because if you think about like the cell is going to regulate this osmolarity, osmolality conversation, like it, it regulates that pretty tightly. Yep. It has to, um, or it's dead. It has to, or it's dead. <laughs> right. Yeah. So like acutely, we're going to see a swing away from homeostasis and potentially if we do that a bunch in small doses over time, we're going to get a performance improvement from it. But like the cell will eventually regulate that back down if it's a chronic exposure type thing. Um, right. Like I know you have guys like Gilbert Lang who have hypothesized that the sodium potassium pump doesn't exist. I think that's probably a little extreme. I think that there is, I think like we have ample evidence that it exists. Like my only, my only thought there is that potentially it's not like it's a volume or an, like it's an intensity based conversation, right? If you think of it as kind of a dimmer switch light, like maybe it's not doing everything we think it's doing but it's definitely there like it's definitely playing a primary role like i'm pretty sure that the structure has been isolated like we know the actual protein composition of the sodium potassium pump yes we were talking about like the cell fluid volume we talked about how acutely we could see that making a difference and then if you stack up acute exposure over time mm -hmm. that could potentially lead to a, a beneficial physiologic change in outcome yeah. For the what also might be interesting too is that what I've noticed is uh, HRV scores tend to be a little bit better too. So I think just providing your body more fluid and electrolytes probably reduces overall stress and just, I hate to use the word, work on the system possibly too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you're saying that when you have clients that start using higher salt or electrolytes, you're noticing better hrv ratings like better recovery for them on a day-by-day week-by-week basis yeah that's what it seems to be again it's anecdotal um the theory there would be maybe you're just expending less resources less you know stress because you've got all the the fluids and everything else your your body potentially needs but yeah that's just one thing i've i've noticed so far yeah because potentially what i could see there is by having the extra fluid volume on board you're going to have less of a systemic deviation from homeostasis. Right. So you get a smaller total, we'll just globally call this stress response, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things happening there. Bear receptors, chemo receptors, all that fun jazz. Yep. But if I'm getting a smaller, like if you think of a, like a straight line, if I'm getting a smaller deviation away from that line, then less, let's call it work, is required to bring me back to homeostasis. So right, hypothetically, in a whiteboard world, I can totally get on board the fact that, yeah, that would make sense for improved recovery. 
Yeah. The hard part is it's a little tricky to test because people may hear this and they'd be like, oh, so I could do my HRV in the morning and then add a bunch of sodium to a liter of fluid, drink that, and then go measure my HRV again, which actually I've done that a couple of times. And many times you will see your HRV go up. Like when I was traveling, I did that. Mine went from 65 to 80 mm-hmm. on the athlete scale. So, you know, much more parasympathetic resting heart rate dropped by about four beats per minute. But again, to your point, that's an acute response probably from just the massive amount of fluid coming in. That doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, you're much more recovered now, right? It's just, it's like pushing you a little bit more on the parasympathetic side and, I think my buddy, Dr. James um, Heathers has published some work on that too, where if you drink a bunch of fluid and then measure HRV, it's it's going to change because primarily of those fluid response and a little bit of stretch in the vessel and your your body has to accommodate that amount of, of fluid right away, right? Because otherwise we'd be in a world of hurt if we couldn't <laughs> accomplish that. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. I didn't think about that, but no, that that, that makes a lot of sense to me. So mm-hmm. thus far, we have seemed to establish that one, using the extra salt and electrolytes, either salting your food, putting electrolytes in your water, is having a beneficial outcome by increasing fluid load, fluid balance, whatever you want to call it, right? Like I just I have more mm-hmm. fluid. I'm holding on to more water. By holding on to more water, then we seem to be getting this kind of spoke wheel effect of beneficial outcomes included like improved acute performance, potentially improved recovery, all these different options that come simply from salt, right? Because as we talked about at the beginning of the episode, the solvent water is going to follow the solute salt. So if I have more salt in my system, I will hold on to more water. And then potentially maybe at the cellular level, you're seeing changes, the ability to get more fluid and things into the cell. Who knows? Maybe I could buy it acutely. Um, But these seem to be all beneficial, positive outcomes. Can you think of a reason? And we already touched on this a little bit. Our salt sensitive folks, obviously a totally different conversation. If you already have high blood pressure, probably talk to your doctor. Um, 100% talk to your doctor, right? But... (laughs) And we're thinking a healthy population. Can you think of reasons not to kind of increase that salt dosage or to put some electrolytes in your water? The only thing I've come up with is, again, I would measure your blood pressure if you want to be extra careful just to make sure you're not one of those salt sensitive people. Mm -hmm. I got that from my buddy, uh, Luke Lehman. Right. So most people, even in fitness, never measure their blood pressure other than once every five years, especially if you're a dude when you go to your doctor. And that's probably not the most accurate measure for various reasons then either. It'll get you in the ballpark. But mm-hmm. um, so you should be measuring blood pressure anyway. Get a cheap Omron unit off of Amazon. It's what, 60 bucks or something. You don't even have to know the skill to do it anymore. Outside of that, the only thing that I have that is really theoretical is at some point your body is going to be more used to the level of fluid and the level of electrolytes. So I played around with this a little bit where I've then all of a sudden just drastically dropped my input of uh, fluid and salt. And that does appear to be a little bit more of a stressor. Again, I've only done this just a couple of times. And again, it could be purely anecdotal. It could have been something else going on or immune hit who knows. Uh, But my HRV has changed a little bit and I've just felt kind of, more crappy than I would expect. But again, maybe that's just because I'm used to a little bit higher level of baseline. And now I notice more of a drop where before when I was much more kind of haphazard with it, hmm, didn't notice as much different. But again, my performance there was also more variable. So maybe there's something to that. But again, that would probably only apply if it is a real thing to someone who would then all of a sudden not have control over that for whatever reason um so i i've kind of played around with maybe at some point you cycle it a little bit where you go down to lower levels and then kind of go back up again kind of like a use stress distress type model okay but, yeah yeah i don't know it's very interesting so i think the next place to go here is and we can kind of wrap this up with this if we're going to think gen- just general generic dosages someone listening like okay 
I haven't been doing this. I want to do it. Do you have rough guideline recommendations in terms of like how much extra salt should they be consuming or how much salt should they be consuming on a daily basis? Cause we got to remember, like we're talking to a population here that trains, right? Like, we're not talking to people that like go to the gym maybe two times a week and like, they don't work the hard. Like if you're listening to this, you probably get after it four to six days a week. So you're slightly different conversation than the general population. Right? So for our people, like if we had some guidelines, like this is probably how much salt you need to be consuming on a day-to-day basis to help get the beneficial outcomes we've been discussing. Yeah. I tell people like just buy good quality uh, sea salt. I use like Redmond, but there's other good quality sea salt Mm -hmm. and just start salting your food to taste, right? At some point you've, we've all done this, right? All of a sudden the the cap explodes off the salt shaker and you put way too much salt on it just tastes horrible. Right. Mm -hmm. But you add some and you're like, Oh, that tastes better. Right. So I'd say start salting your food and then just increase pure water intake at the same amount, not necessarily at the same time. Um, see where you get with that. At some point, you're just kind of using taste to regulate it a little bit. I don't get people, ooh, use half a teaspoon and then use a quarter teaspoon. Just put some salt on your food and see how it tastes. And mm-hmm. if it tastes better, you're probably moving in the right direction. Outside of that, I have used the, the element packets, which is about a 1,000 milligrams of sodium. I'll put that in my little container here, which is just a one liter container. And my sort of rule of thumb for myself and clients is try to drink all of that before your training session. So if you're training at, let's say noon, try to drink all of that before noon. Let's say you get up at six in the morning, right? So you've got one of your markers done, um, in addition to salting your food. After that, if you're training in very humid environments or you're sweating a lot during training, I would have them repeat that again during training. Mm-hmm. And if you're really sweating a lot, like it's been pretty hot and humid in Minnesota lately, I'll have them do the same thing again uh, after training. Um, that's kind of the recommendation I have right now, unless you get into very complicated stuff with looking at, you know, exercise longer than an hour in extreme environments and you know, all that kind of jazz. Yeah, yeah, just normal, general, yeah, yeah. thermo neutral. I work out at a gym that has right. probably air conditioning and it's not ridiculous. Okay, right. <laughs> Beautiful. That's perfect. I will say the, I think the lemon, the lemon lime flavor from Element I've had, it is delicious. It tastes great. It is delicious. Um, <laughs> So I will say the element does come at a higher price point. Like it, it is more expensive per serving. Yes. So if, if you don't want to pony up for that, then I just use what are these Centerplex Revive electrolytes. Oh, nice. You get a hundred servings per container. I'll just hold that up here. If that's going to autofocus. How now? <laughs> Doesn't like there it is. There you go. Uh, yeah, I just do two scoops of that in my like big mason jar in the morning, and then I go lift at noon. So I, I yeah. essentially just do exactly what you what you said. Yeah, and it works great. Yeah. I love it. I have noticed a difference subjectively in terms of just how I feel from a performance standpoint and a recovery standpoint, like doing it versus not doing it. I subjectively notice an improvement. Yeah, the biggest take improvement that I... Worth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the biggest improvement I noticed, I said, is more consistency. And I've noticed that my energy output just feels more consistent for longer during the session. Or sometimes I'd have sessions that would start great and then just like 20 minutes into it, just kind of peter out more. Where at the end, and it's a feeling, but I feel like it's more muscular generated, like I did work, not like I was kind of limited. Like if you ever exercise when you're kind of dehydrated or you're super stressed, like, you know, you could probably do more, but you just feel... Just, yeah. It's just not there. <laughs> yeah, the brain is just shutting that down from the get go. They're like, right. "Yeah, no, you're not doing this." <laughs> right. You just feel like, it. "Oh, I left the parking brake on today." <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna safeguard ourselves. Well, yeah. Mike T. Uh, technological problems aside, <laughs> yeah, it's always a pleasure to get to connect. Um, I wish we could talk longer. I actually have to jump onto a, another call that no we got scheduled here in the back end. But thank you so much for coming on, chatting salt electrolyte goodness with us. Uh, for anybody listening who wants to go find you, where's the best place for them to go to go find Dr. Mike T? Sure. Best place is probably the website, which is through Flex Diet, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com. You can join the wait list there. It'll put you on the newsletter. And then I am putting out more stuff on Instagram now. So you can find me there on Instagram at Dr. Mike T. Nelson, which is just D-R-M-I-K-E-T-N-E-L-S-O-N. Beautiful. 
All right, everybody go check out Dr. Mike T. We'll be sure to pull all that in the show notes as well. So it's gonna be easy for you to find it. Hope that you enjoyed the episode and everybody have a beautiful week.